glad to be here with you this afternoon to um, talk a little bit about the recent detection of African swine fever in the Dominican Republic. Uh, next slide, please, Nate. Um, so as I'm sure you've all heard, on July the 28th, um, our Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory confirmed a wild type African swine fever in eight samples that had been collected from hogs in the Dominican Republic. We've had um, a surveillance uh, cooperative cooperation with the Dominican Republic since 2019. When we initiated the surveillance, um, it was part of our overall strategy for um, uh, ensuring the safety of uh, uh, pork um, and pork producers in the United States. Um, and so we've had that testing going on for a while. The original intent had been to expand that testing beyond the Dominican Republic to other countries in the Caribbean. Um, that has been dramatically slowed down to this point um, due to the COVID pandemic. Um, but obviously um, we now have an opportunity probably to, um, to try our efforts again at continuing to expand that surveillance. So the samples that came into us in late July were um, from regular surveillance that was being carried out in the Dominican. The samples have been um, delivered to us for testing quarterly. So these samples were from February through early July and they've been collected in 19 provinces across the Dominican Republic. There are 32 uh, total provinces in the Dominican Republic. When they sent this set of samples in, um, unlike some of the previous sets of samples we received, they did ask us to um, give a priority to a set of uh, 12 samples where they had seen some clinical signs um, in animals. Our laboratory did that. And in that set of 12 samples um, found African swine fever in um, eight samples from two provinces. Monte Cristi and Sanchez Ramirez. Those two provinces are um, about 100 miles apart, so not close together. Um, and we immediately notified the chief veterinary officer in the Dominican Republic, um, who notified the World Organization for Animal Health, um, the OIE, and um, uh, started the process of um, you know, really looking more closely at what could we continue to do, what do we need to enhance um, to protect the United States. This is the first outbreak of African swine fever in the Americas in the last 40 years. Um, it was eradicated um, from Haiti and the Dominican Republic um, in the late 70s, early 80s. Next slide, please. And so in addition to um, working with the Dominican Republic to continue testing the rest of the samples that they sent us, we really started to look at um, how could we ramp up our vigilance, ramp up our outreach, really try to get um, everybody thinking about and um, helping to protect us um, from African swine fever. As you all know, it's a hardy virus um, and can easily be transmitted with fomites. And so it's really important for us to, to keep our awareness up, particularly in this new situation. So we are working with the Dominican Republic. Um, we are uh, trying to determine um, you know, how we can help them and work with them in as many ways as we can. Um, they are an independent country, and so they are certainly leading the response, and we will continue to offer our support. Um, so, so far, we are providing testing support. We continue to test um, any samples that they're able to provide with us for testing. Um, we are also working closely with them to uh, bolster their in-country testing capacity. Um, we had uh, previously shipped some laboratory equipment to them in hopes of setting up the lab. And, um, and so again, we're speeding that up at this point and expect to be able to have um, staff there from um, USDA labs to train um, local laboratory technicians within the next couple of weeks. Um, they did also provide us a request for some additional uh, personal protective equipment for their responders, which we are um, working to fulfill. Um, expect to be able to have that done this week. Um, and then we continue to consult with their government officials and with officials from other governments and organizations um, about how we can all work together to, together to best support the response and mitigation measures. Um, there's a, there, the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations is very involved as well as um, the OIE and some other regional um, groups of animal health officials. Um, so trying to coordinate and collaborate across all those groups to ensure that we're all offering as much support and help as we can. 
Um, and we've made some similar offers to the government of Haiti, whatever way we can support them and try to stamp out this disease. Um, if they have it, of course, it has not been identified in Haiti at this point. Um, and so um, we do understand from Haiti that uh, we can expect to receive some requests from them in the coming days with regard to um, laboratory support and testing support. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, for us, um, what's really important is to quickly contain and control the outbreak in the Dominican Republic um, to help us, you know, further protect uh, the livestock here in the United States, protect our interests, and also, of course, to help the Dominican um, to um, make sure that they also can have a healthy population of pork swine. So we are working um, very closely to try to um, I help them identify any affected or exposed animals and um, and you know deal with the outbreak that they are having in addition to um, preparing for any possible um, outbreaks in other countries um, or in US territories, um, which is certainly um, something that we want to try to avoid. Next slide, please. So um, we we have been cooperating with a number of agencies across the federal government and with state governments as well, um, in, to protect the United States. You know there are several things that have been in place for quite some time that are preventive measures to help us prevent African swine fever and other foreign animal diseases from entering the United States. And so in this case, we're looking at our opportunities and our best practices to help step those preventive measures up. Um, and make sure that we um, have everybody's awareness and attention. Um, so um, in just a moment, you'll be hearing more from the Customs and Border Protection about the um, work that they are doing at the ports of entry, um, you know, looking at the opportunities to stop any prohibited product and things like that. Um, that's definitely a partnership that we're working um, closely with, working with CBP to provide them information um, all the information that we have to help them make the best uh, best assessments for how to guide their work. Um, we also are working with um, other federal agencies to look at opportunities to share information with them, look at opportunities if there are other um, support mechanisms we might use, and then again working with our state governments as well, just trying to make sure that we are sharing information and have uh, messaging out there as much as possible. Um, we are also uh, trying to make sure that we have uh, proper garbage disposal. Um, that usually comes up to be an issue in many of these types of situations. Um, ships and airplanes um, have foreign garbage, uh, international garbage, food waste um, that is considered dangerous. And so we are um, looking back again to make sure that uh, all those disposal mechanisms are appropriately in place. We're also looking at messaging um, for airline carriers, um, particularly um, to help them um, notify passengers of the concerns and notify them of their requirements for any um, products that they might be moving with them. In addition, um, we had started um, a while back looking at a federal order to establish additional requirements for importing dogs from countries where African swine fever exists. Again, um, African swine fever can travel with fomites and there had been um, concern that um, between the dogs and their bedding and other materials and the kinds of environments they might come from, particularly um, dogs that come to the United States for resale, um, that there might be um, a risk pathway there. And so on August the 6th, we were able to issue a federal order that um, requires that dogs for resale come in from countries where African swine fever exists would be um, bathed and the bedding properly disposed of and the crates properly cleaned um, before they move any further within the United States. Um, and those requirements will become effective on August the 16th. Next slide, please. We're also working um, very closely with Puerto Rico um, to enhance the mitigations there um, because Puerto Rico certainly as a US territory that is uh, very close geographically to the Dominican Republic um, is something that we're very interested in making sure that we have well protected. We know that there's um, a, large, a high degree of travel between the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. 
you know, some through official routes and some through unofficial routes. And so we really want to work closely with them to um, step up our mitigation efforts there. One of the things that's working in our favor here is that um, because many of the Caribbean countries have had classical swine fever for quite some time, we've had mitigations in place to prevent classical swine fever from traveling from the Dominican and other Caribbean countries to Puerto Rico. Um, and those mitigations can be effective for African swine fever as well. So really looking to just build upon what we have in place there for classical swine fever. We are focusing on boat traffic, including inner island commuter traffic and cruise ships, as well as passenger cargo and mail screening. Um, again, really looking at any international garbage um, and making sure that um, the prohibitions are, are appropriately um, met and that um, that garbage is properly disposed of. Puerto Rico does participate in our national African swan fever and classical swan fever surveillance plan. Um, and so we have a um, surveillance in place there. We are looking at opportunities to enhance that surveillance, maybe um, look at more closely at some higher risk swan herds and feral swan, um, and maybe do more sampling than we have been doing up to this point. Um, the epidemiologist and the surveillance um, development team are working on um, those specific details of those plans and should have uh, more information about that in the coming weeks. We've also been working with our wildlife services team um, to conduct some feral swine control um, for quite a while. And we had um, a plan that was laid out to eradicate feral swine over a six year period. Um, we are working at this time to um, try to uh, put more resources into that plan and speed that up. Um, with the hope that we could um, have a significant impact on the population of feral swine over the next 15 to 18 months, and then hopefully be able to cut that eradication period um, in at least half. We've already um, started the process of adding staff and resources to that work in Puerto Rico, and should be able to see significant increases in the number of feral swine um, uh, moved away, uh, taken out of the landscape um, in the coming days and weeks. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, one of the um, primary efforts is really outreach and education. We have social media campaigns on all the approved platforms and we've developed informational material in Spanish, French, Portuguese, Hmong, and traditional Chinese um, to reach as many of the populations as we can in these affected areas and try to make sure they have good information um, about uh, the risks and how they can avoid those risks. Next slide, please. So we're also um, working closely to look at um, the states that allow garbage feeding, which um, does include uh, Puerto Rico as a territory that allows garbage feeding. Um, we have in place already requirements for those um, who are garbage fed swan operations. Um, for them to cook their um, materials before they it's presented to the swan, um, and to, which has been in place for quite some time to prevent potential disease spread. Um, at this time, we are increasing both the inspections at those facilities um, to ensure that the garbage is properly cooked and that they are uh, managing that material appropriately. And we're also, um, again, looking for some education and outreach materials to share with those um, folks who are garbage feeders and help them raise their awareness about the biosecurity concerns and um, the need for them to make sure that they properly treat the garbage before it's fed to the swan. We are also, um, again, just working to expand um, information and thoughts about biosecurity and keep people um, on their uh, toes as much as possible. Um, we're trying to increase awareness of the clinical signs for African swine fever, which can include death, high fever, loss of appetite, depression, reddened skin, vomiting, diarrhea, respiratory distress, and abortions. And we ask that if any producers see signs of African swine fever, um, that you report those immediately to a veterinarian or the state animal health official um, and give us the opportunity to try to find any um, evidence of this disease as early as possible. And then of course, we will advocate to follow good biosecurity practices. The Secure Pork Supply has additional information on how to develop or strengthen herd biosecurity plans. 
And biosecurity is really, really important here. As I mentioned before, um, African swine fever is a disease that can spread very uh, most effectively with fomites. That's one of the primary ways it's um, spread. And so we do wanna be very careful about our biosecurity. We've also um, ramped up our testing capacity at the National Animal Health Laboratory Network, um, have worked with those laboratories to um, have search capacity and have um, the ability to test in the event that um, that is necessary. Um, we've added African swine fever testing to our previously existing classical swine fever surveillance. Um, we focused that testing on high risk animals, sick pig submissions from veterinary diagnostic labs, sick or dead pigs at slaughter, animals from herds at a greater risk due to exposure to feral swine or garbage feeding. Um, and we have had that surveillance in place for a while. We continue, continue to review and evaluate that and make sure that um, we think that surveillance is, is truly getting the most high risk animals. Next slide, please. So just to say a little more about biosecurity, as I mentioned, very, very important. Um, definitely wanna make sure to limit opportunities for any interface with feral swine. And another important area, as I mentioned, uh, fomites can be a real challenge with this virus. So it's really important to address um, truck washing and entry and exit and make sure that not only the people um, who enter and exit, but also any vehicles, particularly those traveling from feed mills or collection points or um, any other areas like that are uh, properly washed, at least with an undercarriage wash and tar wash um, before they enter a facility. Next slide. So then here's the part that you guys probably really want to hear about this afternoon. What if there's a positive? Um, so a positive African swine fever case um, would trigger a federal, state, tribal, and local emergency response plans. Um, we have worked for quite some time on these emergency response plans and do have um, published documents um, on the website. Um, those are generally known as red books um, that have um, a lot of the details about how we, we might respond in an emergency contained in them. We've also worked closely with Canada and Mexico over the last few years to develop a North American strategy um, for how to respond to African swine fever. One of the important points here is that OIE does not differentiate between the country and the territories when determining Af swine, African swine fever status. And so in the event of a detection in Puerto Rico or another US territory, um, that would result in the United States being considered affected. Um, so we would quickly work with our trading partners to try to regionalize the US mainland and so that there are mitigations in place that would prevent the virus from being able to spread from Puerto Rico to the US mainland. And so our teams right now are putting together all of the documentation that would be needed to show those mitigations that are in place so that if this were to happen, which again, we're putting as many mitigations as we can in place to prevent a positive in Puerto Rico. But if we were to get to that point that we would already have all the documentation and all the materials that we need in place to be able to quickly share with our trading partners and show them the protections for the US mainland from Puerto Rico and encourage them to regionalize and try to get us back to um, as much trade as possible as quickly as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So really our goals are to focus on preventing virus transmission and eradicating the virus. Um, as you know, there's no treatment and no vaccine for African swine fever. So really we have to focus on containing and controlling the disease through quarantine and movement controls. Um, as I mentioned, we are working closely with the Dominican now to offer them as much support and help um, as they are interested in having, um, particularly around epidemiology, helping them to understand um, you know, the risks in certain movements and uh, be able to control those movements. Um, in the event of a detection in any part of the United States, you know, we would do the same kinds of things, looking to determine the extent of the disease through tracing and surveillance, um, and trying to make sure that we stop the movement of the virus and eradicate it as quickly as possible. At the same time, we would be trying to um, share public information to stakeholders, to the public, and to the international community about the actions we were taking um, to ensure that um, there's understanding and, and that um, you know, people are following the requirements as needed. Next slide, please. If there is a detection on the US mainland, um, you guys have heard us talk about this before, 
We would strongly consider implementing a national 72 hour movement standstill, requiring all live swine and semen movements to stop during that time. That would give us the opportunity to really evaluate where exactly we have an issue, what exactly the extent of that issue is so that we could look for signs of disease and get the control measures in place quickly um, and hopefully be able to um, keep that uh, introduction very, as small as possible and contain it very quickly and eradicate it very quickly. In the case that we were to do a national movement standstill, swine that were already in transit would be allowed to reach their destination, but no new loads would be allowed to move. Um, processing plants, once we release that control, would probably have to reestablish their schedules for incoming loads. Um, so that could cause some additional herd movement delays, um, but this is something that we've been talking about and exercising. Um, and so uh, we would hope that there are plans in place to help get things restarted as quickly as possible. Uh, in that event, when we did release the national standstill, there could be the need to impose movement restrictions on certain particular areas where we have found African swine fever or suspect it. And in that event, we would certainly implement those movement restrictions, working very closely with state animal health officials. Um, there might also be some control areas that require monitoring or permitted movements, um, something with testing to demonstrate. And again, that would be established uh, in close coordination with um, local animal health officials, state animal health officials. Next slide. We would, in the event of any um, outbreak uh, detection in the United States, be working very closely with the states to provide updates through public announcements, websites, and other media channels. Um, similar to what we're doing now, but with the more detail that you would need about the kind of information that would be impacting us more directly now than it is with this detection in the Dominican Republic. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you this afternoon, and I'm going to quickly turn it over to John um, Sagel with CBP, um, who can provide some more of the details of the CBP work in this area.